This morning we're reading from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 30, and on that um, pew Bible, that's on page 53. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Genesis 32 contains this fascinating story from the life of Jacob, where he has an all-night wrestling match. Scholars debate about who this was exactly that, that Jacob wrestled with, described in NIV simply as a man. Um, many say it was an angel. Some say that it was the angel of the Lord, which many believe to be the pre-incarnate uh, appearances of Jesus himself. But whoever it was, this wrestling match is correlated to wrestling with God. Jacob's name was changed to Israel at this point. And that word translated means, he who wrestles with God. What a great description of the history of the Hebrew nation. They have been wrestling with God from their very beginning, trying to find their way in the world, trying to comprehend just who their Messiah is, trying to understand God's plan for them and the way that he has used them as his chosen people, as a representative nation, for how he deals with all of us. And all of us wrestle with God too. We struggle to understand his higher ways. I've been wrestling with God this morning about hearing about Charles. Okay, why? <sighs> we struggle with God when life doesn't turn out the way that we thought it would. We struggle when sometimes God seems to be so close and other times just so far away. Whenever I read this story, it makes me think of a wrestling match that I actually found myself in the middle of. I was a freshman in college, and a bunch of us guys were just hanging around in the college dorm, and all of a sudden, this big upperclassman football player was goofing around and just grabs me and drags me to the floor. You know, that's stuff that happens in college dorms. <sighs> I think he thought he could just grab the scrawny freshman and pin him to the floor just for fun and just because he could. But stubborn as I was, I tried to wrestle with him, and I wrestled with him about five seconds into it, and I realized that I was not going to beat him. <laughs> but I tried my best not to let him beat me. And soon most of the guys in the hall were watching us and, and teasing this upperclassman who couldn't pin the little freshman, and I gave it my all. And after quite a while, it wasn't all night, it seemed like it, but uh, it was about 10 or 15 minutes, he gave up and he called it a draw. I think maybe he was taking it easy on me and encouraging me for giving him a good match anyway. So I got up and I walked down the hall to the cheers of all the guys in the dorm, trying not to let them know that the whole building was spinning and I was just looking for a place to go throw up. <laughs> he didn't pin me, but I don't think that I could say that I overcame. <laughs> There's no way I, I won. I made it to my room and it soon became known how sick I felt and everybody was concerned and caring about the whole thing, especially the big guy who did it to me. But the glory that I had for not being pinned was very short-lived and everybody knew that I was totally wiped out. And I wonder if perhaps this is how Jacob felt after wrestling with God all night, who did not overpower Jacob, but obviously could have crushed him if he wanted to. I mean, all he did was touch his hip and he wrenched his hip. You know, that shows the power that he had over Jacob. But he allowed Jacob to survive this night, this all-night wrestling match, and not be overcome. This whole wrestling match has come to be a symbol of Jacob's relationship with the Lord and of his prayer life. And the physical struggle that he endured teaches us several things about the spiritual struggle that happens when we spend real time in prayer to God. And we 
seek to truly understand his will and to receive his blessings. And the first lesson is precisely that, that the blessings of God are released into our lives through prayer. Before Jacob was even born, God had prophesied that the family blessing and the privileges of the firstborn would be his and not his brothers, even though his twin brother Esau was technically born first and would have been entitled to those blessings. And you probably know the story about how Jacob connived his brother Esau and he deceived his father Isaac in order to get that blessing. The details of that story are found a little bit earlier in Genesis. If you don't know it, look back and read it. I'm not going to cover all those, but it's an important part of what we're talking about to learn more about all that had happened. But anyway, afterward, Esau was extremely bitter about what had taken place, and understandably so. And this wrestling match that Jacob had with God takes place just before Jacob is preparing to meet with Esau for the first time after all this had happened, you know, years later. Jacob was pretty sure that Esau was going to be violent with him in retribution for what he did to him. Yes, Jacob had received the family blessing, but he wasn't feeling very blessed by it. My point is that it was not until Jacob had this wrestling match with God that the blessing from God really became his. He laid hold of the promise of God through that, that night of prayer. It makes me wonder how often God is ready to fulfill his many promises to us, but is waiting for us to come to him and ask. And it may not just be a matter of asking him to do something, but of struggling with him. Asking him those, those hard questions that maybe we don't really have a right to ask of God Almighty, but still the questions are there, and so we might as well ask. And so we ask him. We ask him why he hasn't acted yet. We ask him why he is doing something that appears to be different from what his promises have always seemed to indicate. Just talking about your life to him, talking about your circumstances and discovering what his role is in your life. The Bible is a book full of promises, thousands of them. And while many of them apply to specific and unique situations, God is faithful to keep all of his promises. And so kind of in a, in a Christ-centered way, every one of those promises is a promise for you and me, and it's a yes for you and me. But rather than simply take that for granted, we need to talk to God about his promises. And you can't talk intelligently if you do not know what those promises are. So that is a very good reason to know your Bible, to read through the Bible. But don't just read through it, pray through it. The Bible is our primary prayer book. And so read through it and lay hold of the promises of God and talk to God about those promises and those blessings. Something else that we can derive from Jacob's experience is that sometimes the blessings of God are released into our lives through persistence and resistance. In a sermon that he preached on Genesis 32, Martin Luther pointed out that the story of Jacob wrestling with God gives us a picture of wrestling in prayer with a seemingly hostile God. As another example of this, he mentions the story of, uh, in the New Testament of the Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus to get healing for her daughter. And in Mark 7, Jesus responds to her, and his response seems kind of harsh and indifferent. In verse 27, he tells her that it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. I mean, how cold is that? Does Jesus actually mean to just send this woman away without hearing her prayer? No, of course not. He's going to heal her daughter. But at first he appears indifferent, hostile, hostile, resistant. So what's going on there? God is not actually hostile or indifferent. The cross shows us how loving and how engaged he is with us. But Jesus is showing us that praying sometimes might feel like there's a distance there. Anyone who has prayed more than just occasionally can testify that sometimes prayer is hard. It can be a struggle, much like a wrestling match. It feels like sometimes that you're fighting with God and that he's resisting you even though you're just doing what he told you to do and, and making your requests known to him. We get used to the fact that our enemy, the devil, fights with us when we pray. I mean, he'll do anything to distract us or to prevent us or to prohibit us from talking to God. And it's hard enough to fight that battle. But when the struggle in prayer seems to be with God, that is truly frustrating. Why does God do that? It seems that we shouldn't have to wrestle with God. He's supposed to be our friend. 
Why doesn't he just let us escape into his loving care and his loving arms and, and enjoy that precious time that we can spend with him? Well, you need to know that most of the time that's exactly what he does do. Our prayer time is a refuge and a source of strength and comfort and encouragement. But there are those times when God appears resistant to us, when he almost appears hostile. He seems to be pushing against us, resisting us. And prayer can really be a struggle when that is the case. But God just may be testing the strength of our faith in his goodness. Like a child trying to push against the hand of his parent. The parent gives only enough resistance to, to test the resolve of the child. And so God resists us in prayer to see our resolve in his goodness, to see if we really do believe in him, if we really do believe that he is good, if we really do value our relationship with him, or if we just kind of see him as the sh sugar daddy who gives us stuff when we ask him for it. To truly experience what God wants to do in your life, sometimes you have to struggle. You have to persist against his resistance. Something else about Jacob's experience shows us that the blessings of God are not obtained by our contriving. At the end of this wrestling match, God asked Jacob for his name. He already knows his name, of course, but he wants Jacob to state it. Now, if you remember that story with uh, uh, Jacob and his stealing of the blessing, you, you might remember that when, when Jacob had stolen the blessing, his father Isaac had asked for his name. And Jacob lied. He says, my name is Esau. And because of his lie, he received the family blessing from his father because of his father's poor eyesight. Uh, Isaac thought that he was blessing Esau. But now, as Jacob requests this blessing from his wrestling opponent, and again he is asked to identify himself by name, he tells the truth. He says, my name is Jacob. The name Jacob literally means he grasps the heel. And he was named that because when the twins were born, Esau was born first, but Jacob came out grasping onto the heel of his brother. And that word Jacob would then come to figuratively mean a supplanter or a deceiver. And that would pretty much describe the kind of person that Jacob was, to, to trick his brother into giving up his birthright and to trick his father as to his identity. So there's something very significant about God demanding that Jacob identify himself by name and Jacob saying his name, in effect saying, I am the deceiver. <laughs> I've tried all my life to obtain these blessings by myself and by my own manipulation. I'm Jacob, and now I'm repenting. And so God gives him a new name, Israel, which as I said before, literally means he who wrestles with God. And it's no coincidence that the entire Hebrew nation would also come to be known as Israel. And that name certainly describes this nation that has been singled out by God as his own chosen people, but who have struggled mightily throughout that relationship. Israel is, of course, a representative nation used as an example of how God deals with all of us. And so this blessing was given to Jacob after he wrestled with God, but not because he wrestled it away from God, but because God chose to give it to him. The lesson for each of us is very important and very profound. Because some people have some pretty confused ideas about prayer. Yes, we are told to ask God for what we want and to be persistent and to be specific. And don't give up praying until you have your answer. That's very biblical and very accurate advice. But the reason to do that is not because prayer is some kind of formula. You do it the right way with all the right ingredients and you say all the right words and then you get what you want in life, presto. No, prayer is simply connecting with God and sharing with him what's on your heart. You talk to him about what you want and why you want it. You tell him how and what you're feeling and then you learn how much he cares about that. That's what he wants from you and how much he loves to hear you tell him. Some people approach God as if they can make some kind of deal with him. Okay, God, I prayed in Jesus' name. I, I prayed 10 times a day. I've been real good about going to church. I've been limiting my sin pretty much. I've been doing all kinds of nice things for other people, so I think now you owe me. You need to bless me now. You need to answer my prayer the way that I want you to answer it. There's a joke about a mother and son who lived in a forest. One day a tornado roared through. The mother clung to a tree and tried to hold her son, but the swirling winds carried him into the sky. 
The woman began to weep and pray, Please, O oh Lord, bring back my boy. He's all I have. I'll do anything not to lose him. If you bring him back, I'll serve you all my days. Suddenly the boy toppled from the sky, right at her feet. He was a bit mussed up, but safe and sound. His mother joyfully brushed him off. Then she stopped for a moment and looked up to the sky and said, uh, Lord, he had a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Often people turn their prayers into kind of, let's make a deal. That's just not how God works. If he initiates a covenant, then so be it. He can do that. He's God. But we don't deal with God. We might wrestle with him. We might argue with him. But ultimately, the blessing that you are seeking for is not going to come by your striving, by your conniving, by your contriving, by your dealing, by your deceiving. It comes just by submitting. Winning the blessing only comes by losing to God. <laughs> and that's the next point I want to make, is that God himself is the blessing that we seek. You notice that God does not end the encounter with Jacob by assuring him that everything's going to be fine. He simply sent him on his way to meet Esau. There's no promise that Jacob is going to live throughout the next day. Verse 31 tells us that he's limping because of the injury that he incurred in wrestling with God. So he couldn't even run away if he wanted to. Chapter 33 tells us how this encounter turned out. Verse 1 says, Jacob looked up and there was Esau, coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Jacob still has some issues, and that's going to come back and get him later. But uh, He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants and their children approached and bowed down. Next Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What do you mean by all these droves I met? to find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Jacob received a blessing that was far greater than any earthly blessing that he had received thus far. And that was the restoration of his relationship with Esau. All that he thought that he cared about and all that he connived to, to obtain really wasn't worth it if it meant losing that relationship. But even greater than that, Jacob discovered that being able to relate to God himself is the greatest of all blessings and privileges. Even if Esau did not respond favorably to Jacob, even if Esau would have beaten him to a pulp that day, Jacob would have come out ahead because he had encountered the living God and he had faced up to his past and he had found the real meaning of life is knowing God and the freedom and the victory and the forgiveness that he offers through our faith in him. And I plead with you, whatever that is that you're searching for in life, I can guarantee you that it cannot replace that relationship with God. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, you seek God first, you seek his kingdom first, you put him first, and all these other things, they'll be added unto you. Your perspective changes when you begin to just walk with God day by day. Sometimes God may withhold that blessing that you're seeking in order to teach you just that, because a relationship with him is the greatest of all his blessings he could possibly give you. God may not promise you that you will get the specific answer to your prayer request, get you that job you've been praying for, or that boyfriend or girlfriend you've always wanted, or that marriage that you were seeking, or that healing that you desire. But he does promise himself. And the test may sometimes be to ask yourself, even if God does not answer my prayer the way I want him to, will I still praise him? Will I still serve him? Will I still testify to his grace and his goodness? God doesn't always change your situation. Sometimes he just changes you your identity, your perspective. He changes you from a Jacob to an Israel. So you can say, even in the midst of the shadow of death, that God is with you, and that's always enough. 
The result of a night of prayer is not necessarily the resolution of all your problems, but it's the restoration of your most desperately needed relationship. One more point I want to make about this story is that we know that God hears us because he became weak for us. Jacob's wrestling match was not an even fight. When you're in a wrestling match above your weight class, you don't stand much of a chance, as I found out in that college dorm. Well, what's God's weight class? You know, how much does omnipotence weigh? <laughs> Jacob should have been crushed, but he wasn't, which means that God voluntarily held himself back. God became voluntarily weak. God feigned weakness to make his point and to bring salvation to Jacob. Centuries later, the full weight that Jacob deserved came down on Jesus Christ. When God became man in the form of Jesus Christ, he emptied himself of his divine prerogative and, and came down to our level so that he could save us. Author and pastor Tim Keller says, Jacob held on at the risk of his life to get the blessing for himself, but Jesus held on at the cost of his life to get the blessing for us. Philippians 2.6 says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus voluntarily became weak. He allowed himself to be hung up there on the cross so that we can approach the very throne of God and have our sins dealt with once and for all. And so we can be sure that Jesus cares enough to listen to us when we pray. When we wrestle with him in prayer, he comes down to our level and he hears us. It may seem sometimes that God's not listening, but he always is. The cross assures us that Jesus is always listening. God cared enough to come down to Jacob and wrestle with him. God cared enough for us that he came down and he took on our flesh, wrestling with our sin until it squeezed the very life out of him. But he won the battle when he rose from the dead. And now he has united himself to us forever. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God is not distant, waiting for us to say some magic words or, or waiting for us to fix our lives until he will hear us in our prayers. He stands ready and willing to hear us now. So press on. Press on in prayer. Never, ever give up. If you are struggling with some issues in your life, Take your struggles to God. The blessings that he wants to give you are released into your life through that prayer. Sometimes that prayer can be a struggle itself. You feel tugged and pulled and stretched in ways that can be very uncomfortable. But that struggle is also necessary to experience the blessings of God. You can't connive or bargain or deceive your way to those blessings, but you can experience a fresh relationship with the Lord God who lowers himself to our level so that we can know him, so that we can struggle with him, and we can better understand his plan for us. If you don't have that relationship, you can start one today by receiving the free gift that he offered to you to pay the penalty for your sins and to allow you to be born again and to, to enter a brand new life. Won't you turn to him today?